Hello. Uh, we are going to start today our lecture on Caliban and the Witch um, by Silvia Federici. Caliban uh, is um, it's a figure uh, that represents peasants, and the witch in this case represents the women that were able to control uh, our reproductive needs uh, during medieval ages. The witches were the ones that had the capacity to help women not conceive or abort uh, fetuses that were not wanted. So uh, Federici is going to tell us a story, Silvia Federici is going to tell us a story of uh, from the viewpoint of the peasant and the woman of medieval ages during uh, the time when capitalism is beginning to rise. So Federici was born in Italy, but she spent most of his life here in the United States. And she was born in 1942. She's a very good friend of Stepik. Uh, she came to the program to assess our quality and wrote a very nice report about us. And she's also been to visit us and gave talks. We are hoping to bring her over soon again. So as I said, she was born in Italy, but came to the US for a PhD in philosophy which she got at University of Buffalo. And then later on, uh, she uh, went to teach at Hofstra and eventually became emerita. Um, she is not only an academic, she's a very well-known activist. She's the co-founder of the International Feminist Collective of the Committee for Academic Freedom in Africa and for the Radical Philosophy Association Anti-Death Penalty Project. She comes from an interesting philosophical tradition. I would define her as a radical feminist Marxist autonomist. That means that she has a grounding in Marxism. Uh, she's also uh, a feminist within Marxism and an autonomist, uh, which is a kind of Marxism that incorporates without ever acknowledging so much of the teachings and politics of the anarchists although they don't get to those uh, conclusions through the anarchists, but through other Marxist authors, like, for example, her own partner, George Caffensis, a very well-known Italian, Tony Negri, Michael Hart, who writes with Tony Negri sometimes, Paolo Virno, Tronti, um, I'm blanking on some names here, but it's a very important tradition that comes from Italy mostly, uh, of uh, autonomous Marxists that try to um, somehow attempt to disrupt this thing that we were talking about, the Soviet Union, the totalitarian aspect of Marxism, the controlling things from the top, the centralization of Marxism. We'll talk more about autonomism in the future. So Federici uh, gets to this autonomism, as does Negri and others, in part through Michel Foucault that we'll study at the end of this semester. A Foucault, in the history of sexuality, says that power under capitalism became something very different than power under medieval ages. At that time, if you recall, people would be burned, um, tortured, and eventually killed for, for example, attempting to against the life of their fathers, which were the same as atten attempting against the life of the king. So uh, for Foucault, this kind of power of the kings and lords was the power to allow you to not die. They had the power to kill you. But under liberalism, uh, power under democracies is more the power of what do they, people in power, allow to live? what kind of life do they foster, and how do they administer that life. So we see the population as subject of politics, techniques, and sciences to control, enhance, or destroy life. Think, for example, about being transgender. How many different apparatuses um, from science uh, and uh, um, how many techniques, uh, how many laws and politics are placed nowadays to protect or not transgender people. 
think about the bathroom laws in the South, for example. That's a, that's a technique of power. If you allow anybody to go into a bathroom, you're allowing for all kinds of life. If you allow only certain people with certain body parts to go into certain bathrooms, you are messing with life there because all people need to go to the bathroom. So even from the most minimum thing as who can go into whose bathroom, we can see how liberalism and modern democracies deploy a number of techniques, politics, and sciences because we need to determine very clearly whether a transgender person is this, that, or the other. We'll apply sciences to this person, and that would eventually either enhance life of this population or destroy it. So other important concepts that Federici is working with, and I think are going to help you understand the text, is that for Marx, and we've talked about this, calling it Eurocentrism, uh, evolution was unilinear. We started with the uh, savages, uh, with the hunter-gatherers, as we call them. We went through slavery, the serfdom of medieval ages, then the proletariats of the of capitalism, and hopefully one day we'll get to be the communards of the communist society. So that's a unilinear evolution. It doesn't take into account all the backs and forth, all the indigenous people that had different ways of living, uh, people who uh, are still today living very differently from uh, what Marx would have expected us to do. So if we take into account all these different ways of evolution, we call that multilinear evolution, multilinear social evolution. She also pays a lot of attention to production and reproduction of labor. So production of labor is me going to work and laboring for somebody else or for myself. Uh, and reproduction of labor is what happens before, after, and during. Uh, for one thing, somebody had to give birth to me for me to be able to go and labor somewhere. So that, that's the main reproduction that's going on, uh, people who give birth. In, 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 a, in medieval ages, that was something that was not as well uh, controlled as it is now. Uh, people were mostly left on their own. To, if they wanted to have 13 children, if they could support them, that was their deal. If, if they couldn't, then they would die. But there weren't any kind of laws or incentives or, or, or nothing, not even social uh, norms that would tell people how many children they could have. Other aspects of reproduction of labor are also being able to be fed and clothed, um, uh, be taken care of when you are sick, uh, be taken care of while you are growing up and cannot fend for yourself. So that's something that Federici is going to base most of her analysis on. She's going to use the issue of production and reproduction of labor as, as the tool through which she's going to study this moment of what we call original or primitive acc accumulation of capital. The moment when a feudal society elements within feudal society, the bourgeois, start accumulating huge amounts of wealth in order to uh, be able to accumulate even more wealth uh, it, through the um, Industrial Revolution. Another concept that you are going to hear uh, and read throughout the text is the concept of commodification. If you remember last class, surplus value, uh, we said that uh, commodities is the stuff that we make to sell in the market, not the stuff that we make for ourselves. It's what has exchange value in the market. We can sell it for money or exchange it for other goods. So when we talk about commodification of life, commodification of women, commodification of joy, we are talking about, for example, women being sold in the market, whether it's through prostitution or through ourselves uh, having to show ourselves with few clothes, for example, in order to be able to sell cars. That's a commodification of a woman's body in order to acquire wealth in some way. Um, we can also talk about commodification of joy when they sell us drugs that makes us happy. 
if we cannot be joyful with all those drugs that makes us happy at the parties, well, we can talk about a commodification of joy in that case. Commodification of knowledge. I'm selling you my knowledge. I'm not selling you my knowledge directly, but I'm selling it through, to you through UMass. If you don't pay to UMass, you don't get to hear my knowledge if I have any. So uh, under capitalism, uh, we can talk about commodification of life as a whole. Most of what we do can be somehow uh, assessed in a money in, in 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 money. We can put a price to what we do, to what we are, to who we are. We talk about how much are you worth, right? What's your worth? Well, that's commodification of life. So Federici is very, very keen, and remember this, in saying that there was no transition to capitalism. When we talk about transition, we think that's, that it's something that uh, starts small and then becomes a little bigger, and then it's so, so big that it takes all over. So that would be a transition, something that might not be ordered, might be disorganized, but there's a certain, almost like a plan to it. There's a line that we follow, and sometimes we fall backwards, and sometimes we go forward, but there's like a general idea of where we are going to. Federici says that none of this happened under feudalism when capitalism is beginning to rise. He said that the feudal economy was in serious crisis. By late Middle Ages, wages were high, and the lords were not getting enough uh, returns for the rents. So in response to this crisis, they do what we've seen, we've been studying since the beginning of the semester. They, the ruling class, the European ruling class, launch a global colonizing offensive that leads to world capitalism. So what Federici is going to describe now is the same thing that Quijano described for us, only that Quijano looked at it from the perspective of Latin America being colonized and brutalized by the Spanish and Federici is looking at it from the perspective of the European uh, peasant, the European worker, and the European women that were part of this process without losing sight of what capitalism was doing in the colonies, but focusing on what happened in Europe, how the European um, uh, class, the European proletarian class came to be as a class of proletarians, of people who work for wages. Is, so she says very clear, it's not a transition, but rather an open, violent, brutal process of expropriation and accumulation of capital. So again, if we remember uh, surplus value, expropriation is what we take from somebody who's working for us. We expropriate their surplus value and we barely pay them what they can, what they need to reproduce their needs, to reproduce their labor in order to be able to reproduce other little working class people in, for the future of capitalism, capitalism, and in order to be able to feed themselves, take care of their sicknesses, etc. An accumulation of capital is this concept that Marx develops uh, that without accumulating an enough big amount of money initially, capital cannot uh, uh, really uh, produce, reproduce itself because you need money to make money. So nowadays we have all these uh, people that start uh, seed projects and they try to uh, get money from lots of investors at the same time. It, that's one way of, of original accumulation of capital on a small scale for one person who wants to start a business. But what the European ruling class did is that they dispossess all of the global south, Africa, Asia, Latin America, um, in Australia and many other parts of the world in order for them to have enough wealth so that they could uh, uh, create machines and create uh, the engines and the different kinds of technologies that spearheaded the uh, Industrial Revolution. So Marx talks about the original or primitive accumulation uh, in, in the capital in vol volume one. And I think I might have uh, linked to that 
And if somebody wants to read it, uh, just let me know and I can get a copy for you and put it up in Moodle if I haven't. Uh, so what I said before, capitalism needs capital and labor to initiate uh, its process. And this capital comes from the expropriation of workers. And here it's important to uh, determine this because what the bourgeois have always said historically is that the poor are poor because they cannot control their needs, their wants. So, you know, they get their wages, they immediately go get drunk, then they have sex with the wife, the unprotected sex with the wife, they have another kid. So they spend half of their money at the tavern, and then the other half is already gone because they're going to, ha to have to feed another child. That's what they are for. Instead, the bourgeois, and this is something that they work very hard on, at least ideologically, is very clean, um, always punctual, always on time. He can control his passions so he doesn't drink all of his earnings. And uh, when he has sex with his wife, he's very careful not to have more children than those that he wants to support or can support. Uh, so that he doesn't water down his inheritance. If Federici, Marx, and all the Marxists in the world and all the anarchists in the world laugh at this concept and they say the poor are poor because you take away their surplus value and then they are so alienated that yes, indeed, sometimes they drink their wages and they have sex with the wife at inappropriate times or without the appropriate um, precautions in order not to reproduce more proletarians. Uh, but uh, for Marxists, as I said, and anarchists, it's silly to think that it's a matter of uh, morals and abstinence that makes the rich richer than the poor. So Federici is a hero to all Marxist women and to all Foucaultian women as well, because she fixes both Marx and Foucault. Uh, in Marx, she says, well, Marx doesn't mention the capitalist changes to labor reproduction and power and women's social position. There's no mention of the witch hunt in all of Marx's works. How come Marx didn't see that in order for the capitalists to uh, harness the labor uh, capacity of the workers, they also had to make sure that women would reproduce according to the needs of capitalism, according to the needs of labor. How come they, he, he didn't see at all and he naturalized the role of women giving birth? At some point he says, well, women cannot stop giving birth. Well, yes, we can, but Marx didn't see that. Uh, Marx also didn't see women's social position, the change that happened for women when they were peasants under feudalism and when they were the wives of the proletarians. He didn't see the amount of power that women lose and how women became part of the background or almost. For Marx, women are not really subjects of capitalism. They are naturalized. And the fact that he doesn't mention the witch hunt for Silvia Federici is a huge deal because um, according to Federici, and many people agree with her, the witches were the women who could control uh, reproduction of uh, birth rates. And during capitalism, uh, there's a huge push to increase um, the population because they realize uh, that the population is the one that produces wealth. So if you have small populations, you cannot compete with other liberal states. For example, Germany would lose all its wars against France because they don't have enough people to send to the battlefield. And they don't have enough people to make money for the state and for the corporations. So this is something that uh, Federici sees very clearly. And she sort of like, uh, you know, she uh, admo admonishes Marx on having mixed, m missed this. If fixing Foucault will require a little more explanation because we haven't read Foucault yet. But Foucault claimed that the Catholic confession was a way to normalize behavior uh, of capitalism to achieve a laboring population. And he places this around the 17th century. He says that through the Catholic Church and the confession, people were normalized into having hetero behaviors 
and that many uh, sexualities were created in the sense that be sexual behaviors that before were maybe laughed at or not very much taken into account or considered um, children's peccadillos, all of a sudden they become real things that need to be ostracized either to the asylum or to the bordello, to the whorehouse. Um, so um, Foucault says that all of this normalizing of sexuality that we live today as normal happened in the 17th century through the confession of the Catholic Church. And Felici says, well, yeah, this might have happened too, but this is not what created capitalism. What really created and ensured capitalism was the fact that the witches were hunted and killed so that they couldn't aid in the, uh, in the abortions, in the herbs that would stop uh, procreation. Um, there was a population crisis at the beginning of capitalism. They needed more bodies and the witches were attempting, uh, 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 attempting with their techniques to stop reproduction. They were attempting against the state's rising in, in, in population and thus in property and value. So there's a strong connection clearly in, at this time between property and paternity so women are very much enslaved to one man uh, and, and uh, monogamy so that uh, money that was transferred uh, th through the bourgeois families ended up in the m hands of the same people with the same blood and not go somewhere else if women stray from the uh, conjugal bedroom. So women become subjects of the law eventually under capitalism, which they were not under feudalism. But according to Federici, in pre-capitalist Europe, women's subordination to men had been tempered by the commons. While in the new capitalist regime, women themselves became the commons because women's bodies were naturalized and women became um, just a, a breeding bodies, a natural resource that lay outside of the sphere of the market. No matter if the woman was a high class woman or a low class woman, she, she, her body was meant for reproduction and reproduction only. Although they were subjects of the law and they were not subjects of the law under feudalism, under feudalism they had the commons, the spaces, where they could take sheep that, was their, their, that were their own sheep or plant gardens that were their own gardens. So they had some uh, measurement of economic uh, independence, which they completely lose under capitalism when they become just meat, basically, to reproduce more meat for the proletarian market. So the main points that Federici is bringing up here is original accumulation was not only the result of exploitation and expropriation of European male workers, but also of all Native Americans and of Africans. And of obviously, uh, when she says Native Americans, she's also talking about Americans in the South and um, people in India, etc. The process required that the body be turned into a machine and that women should be subjugated for reproduction of labor. That's why the witches, again, were um, killed. So women become uh, reproductive uh, machines, basically. They become nature. They become, uh, um, they become a commodity that's accessible to everybody because uh, they are no longer subjects of themselves, their bodies are just there for reproduction uh, of other uh, workers. Uh, she sees accumulation as a result of harnessing divisions and differences within the working class. So she sees that this process of accumulation is done by genderizing the population. Women are going to reproduce, men are going to produce, uh, race, there are certain races, as Quijano explained, that will become enslaved or be always low-wage workers. And age 
also starts playing a role here because if women were of reproductive age, they had a certain status. If they were not, they had a very different status. So uh, here, a big difference with Quijano, uh, and this is why I'm interested in, in, in autonomous Marxism, she's able to see many, many axes of oppression and see how all of those axes of oppression create <clears throat> the conditions for the subjugation of labor, not just the economic conditions, but also gender, race, age. And if we keep on reading, she will bring in sexuality, able-bodiedness, and other axes of oppression resistance. And she's not hierarchizing them. She's not saying the economics are the most important axis of oppression resistance, as Marx and many other Marxists said. So in her terms, proletarian, especially women proletarian, are worse off under capitalism than under feudalism. This is something that many uh, orthodox Marxists, or what we call sometimes square out Marxists, will critique of her and will bring her down because of this. But because of this way of, of her thinking about um, the, um, the advantages or not of capitalism versus feudalism, she has a very strong hold with everybody who's doing decolonial theory right now, because in decolonial theory, <clears throat> the advantages of liberalism that most of us sign on to, uh, freedom of expression, uh, nowadays women dressing any way they want, having the children that I want to have or not, and other things that we consider freedoms of capitalism, they come under attack by folks who are interested in um, honoring the, tradi the pre-capitalist traditions of people in the global south, the indigenous people that don't always have, in most cases don't have, for example, notions of a Western justice. And we can talk more about that if folks are interested what uh, indigenous justice sometimes looks like. So she says that uh, the process of accumulation was mostly a process of accumulating by dividing the population. There is a global assembly line now since uh, colonization. Workers in the colonies provide raw materials, workers in Europe produce the commodities, and women at home reproduce labor. They cook, they mend, they sew, they plant little gardens for, them, for their families if they can, and they make children that are going to become the proletarians of the future, or the women that will take care of the proletarians. It's a mistake to think that there was a community between Europe laborer and European capitalists over common desire for cheap goods. So here Federici is going to try to save the European worker from being also a European colonizer. She says that the European worker was divided from the European colonizer and that in reality, even though it's true that the European worker access cheaper goods because these goods were uh, the fruit of raw materials that were taken almost for free from the colonies, but in reality, because of slavery, wages and union organizing in Europe were very low. It was only after the abolition of slavery that European workers were able to unionize properly and get higher wages because having this very, very uh, cheap, uh, not cheap, but free um, production of labor in the global south enabled for uh, stricter control of the uh, workers in Europe. In, according to her, both um, colonized people in the global south and the proletarians of Europe suffered under capitalism. And I agree, obviously, that both groups suffered. We just have to see the amounts of revolutions that were repressed during the uh, times when capitalism is rising, the brutality of life in those early years of capitalism, you read Marx and you want to cry when you read about the, the conditions of the working class, but we don't know that the workers in Europe were conscious of all of this. We see that they were not benefiting from slavery, 
on an objective way, but were they conscious that they were not benefiting from slavery in a in a in a in in, in any way? This would be the way to determine whether there was a commonality of, of interest that they were aware of or not. In any case, uh, the white proletarian is separated from the black proletarian by the segregation laws of the 1650. So this is something that Federici uses to explain that they were uh, conscious that there was a need for unity and that this unity was uh, destroyed by these segregation laws. Something similar did happen in the United States. If you study the history of union organizing in the United States, there was a time where uh, black workers were considered too much into wild, wild cat striking that would strike without uh, organizing first and letting the bosses know that they were going to strike and strict laws were uh, uh, put in place to ensure that black people would not be part of the unions. So there was a huge effort on the side of capitalist and corrupt bureaucratic union leaders to racialize labor in the United States, and to this day we see the consequences of that. So in conclusion, what Federici is saying that is that along with the interna international division of labor, colonization, what Kikano talked about, the raw materials produced in the global south, the uh, production of commodities in the north, in Europe, the sexual division of labor was above all a power relation, a division within the workforce while being an immense boost to capital accumulation. So the sexual division of labor, the guy goes to work at the mine or at the factory, and women stay home mending, sewing, cooking, uh, making more babies, is a power relation. A relation of power in the sense that it benefits the state because it controls women's bodies, it controls the way that women can uh, reproduce themselves, it controls the amount of workers that a state can count on, and it's also a power relation within the house because the husband goes to work, is empowered, is a breadwinner, and the woman's work is naturalized, is considered part of nature, uh, just as coal. We don't thank coal for being there on the ground and allowing us to uh, plunder it. We just take it. Women became the same thing, both for men at home and for uh, the state. So here's where we see patriarchy, right? It's a division within the workforce in the sense that it created a huge division between man and woman by uh, showing men as the ones who are bringing home the bread and women as secondary naturalized um, work that wasn't paid or was not even considered as something that should be paid. And it was also at the same time an immense boost to capital accumulation because it silent uh, slave workers in a way of the home uh, were the ones that were enabling all these men who could go to work from morning till night because they were doing all the stuff that needed to be done to reproduce this man's needs and to reproduce the new workers of the future. So Federici is somebody who's critical of Marx and Foucault at the same time that she is a Foucaultian and a Marxist. So when you read the text, which is not easy to read, it's verbose, it has a lot of data, it, uh, bear these two things in mind. She's walking this line between uh, the strictures of Marxism in the sense of looking at how capital is produced and at the same time seeing that capital is not only produced through economic coercion or economic means, but also through the harnessing of the work of women, naturalizing the work of women, forced maternity of women by removing uh, the knowledge held by the witches, witches that would help them uh, not have children, and also think about uh, the fact that she has this critique of Marxism in the sense that she doesn't think of capitalism as um, progressive for women particularly or for workers in general over um, feudal medieval ages. Bueno, hope you enjoyed the lecture and hope you enjoyed the reading.